So far in this Made for More content, uh, we've heard two things. Rob has inspired us. He's inspired us and given us a theological foundation for why we must labor to see each and every uniquely made image bearer as an equipped, mobilized, and released part of God's master work, his master plan in this wondrous tapestry of his creative genius called the church. And then Damon, of course, uh, has shown us that our pride, and I hope you took notes on that, that our pride pushes us to try and fill our own coffers and supply the needs of our vision through using people as a part of our machine rather than releasing people as a part of God's integral plan. And so after having been inspired that the Word of God is very clear, it is very true, it is very full on what God is doing, will do, longs to do in the lives of people as He has uniquely made them, shaped them, formed them, gifted them with works to do beforehand prior to even bringing them into the family, and then understanding the nature of how we generally go about things in securing people to fill slots to fulfill our vision and our mission and our strategy, you may be left wondering, okay, I've been inspired and I know the problem, but how do we move forward? What is the way that we move out of the mindset of supply and demand, as it were, and actually activate the theological foundation that we have in front of us in Ephesians? Well, I've got eight things that I would like to share with you, eight very practical things that I would like to share with you in that regard. But I want to start with a story. And you're going to think I'm name dropping. I know you will. Uh, and I'll go ahead and tell you that I'm not, uh, but you still won't believe me. And that's okay, because I'm bigger than you, and you won't say it to my face. But, uh, <laughs> but there's a man you know of. His name is Lecrae Moore. And the first time that I met Lecrae Moore, and he became a part of our community, he began to tell me all of the ways that he was going to serve the church. He was going to serve in the kids because he had a passion for kids. And he was going to serve on the worship team because, of course, we could use a little infusion of hip-hop into our transcultural community. Uh, and eventually, he was going to grow into eldership. This was at about this point in his career. And the trajectory of where he was going and where he is now was... Uh, at, a, at a critical moment, and he was still trying to focus his energies in helping me accomplish my vision. And I remember several months went by, he was in the elder process, and several months went by where he was missing meetings, missing trainings, missing opportunities to actually walk in that function. And in the midst of that, he did an interview with another popular pastor at the time who was a friend of mine who knew that he was in our elder process. And when the pastor brought that up to him, he said, hey, I heard you're in the elder process with Renovation Church. When do you think you're going to get that completed with everything that you have going on? And I'll never forget what he said because it's become a running joke around our community. He said, in the winter months, nebulous, in the winter months, no end date, no determinative time, because I believe in his heart he knew that he would never actually finish becoming an elder with Renovation Church. And after about six months of doing this dance, I sat down with this brother, and we had a lengthy conversation, and I told him what I thought. I said, can I tell you what I think? He said, of course, you can tell me what you think. I said, you're never going to be an elder here, at least not right now, and you're not going to serve in kids' ministry, and you're not going to be a part of our worship team. God has uniquely gifted you with a voice, with a story, with a narrative that allows you to navigate a world that I will never get to navigate, that I will never be a part of you get the opportunity to carry music and carry the heart of Christ into communities that I will never get to speak to. You don't need to be a pastor rapper. In fact, I'm the one that got him in trouble when I told him you don't need to be a Christian rapper. You can just be a Christian who's a gifted artist who is taking Christ into every nook and cranny of the world through your gift, and that's okay. And just because you're not expressing that gift within the four walls of this church doesn't mean that you're an unfaithful member of this church. 
In fact, the better you are at carrying that gift into the broader world and reflecting a biblical worldview, which we'll get into here in a minute, versus just Bible knowledge across bars, you fulfill the vision of Renovation Church. And my name doesn't have to be attached to it. And I don't have to be a part of that story to the degree that you point back to the place where you attend and where you're discipled when you're not activated in your ministry. And I believe he would tell you uh, that that was a significant turning point for him, a freedom that he had not felt before when he knew that his senior pastor told him, don't stay and pour out your gifts on my stage because it will help us build our church. Go, go and be salt and light in a community, in a world that is plagued by opulence, violence, misogyny, and tell the biblical narrative of what it means to be a man of God who loves a woman of God, who understands the plan of God through good music and see as many lives transformed as possible. That is not me patting myself on the back. Uh, it took us a long time to get to this place. It took a lot of, uh, of uh, work of the Holy Spirit to massage out of me paternalism, to massage out of me reductionism, to massage out of me insecurity, to massage out of me distance. It took a lot of work by the Holy Spirit to press those things away in order that I can see that every single member of God's church is not a tool in my hands to accomplish the vision he has given me, but in fact they are uniquely wired to do the thing that God has set aside for them to do, and that it is my responsibility to create pathways, undergird their desires, build guardrails on which they can run, and encourage them in their work. And so here, with my remaining time, let me give you eight very practical things that I believe will help you along the way to making this transition. Number one, transitioning from a mindset of from them to a mindset of for them. So let me say that in a more succinct way. Think for them, not from them. For them, not from them. What do I want for them? What do I want for them rather than what do I want from them? This is a significant mind shift because when you begin to think what you want for someone, then how they serve your ends becomes tertiary to who they become as God is making them who they're meant to be. And how they accomplish your vision falls far down the rung of uh, responsibilities and burdens upon them. And what rises to the surface is how they are maximized in the way that God has made them. So the first thing that has to take place is a mentality shift. You have to look at every single person from elder to staff to laity to first-time guest and think, what can I do for them? What can I do for them? rather than what can I get from them. And if we're honest, let's just be honest, I'm a church planter and a scratch church planter at that, so I felt the desperation of need when I knew that I was going to be leading worship, preaching, setting up chairs, and teaching kids ministry in the same morning. Some of you, you don't understand that because you came from big churches and they sent you out with a thousand people and you think you planted a church. But but when you parachute into a place where you know no one, then everyone is a potential to help you do your thing. And that's the wrong mindset. We have to look at people and think, what can I do for them to see them become who God is making them? Number two, you have to distinguish discipleship from development. You have to distinguish discipleship from development. I don't freak out, but those are two different things. Discipleship is ensuring that someone is becoming more like Jesus. That is the baseline of discipleship, to ensure as best you can through teaching, through shepherding, through 
preaching, through, uh, uh, through intimate relationships and vulnerability and transparency, that people are becoming more like Jesus, that their lives and their hearts are more daily reflecting the wonder and glory of God in every single aspect of their reality. But development is not discipleship. Development is the intentional and instructive shaping of their gifts and their talents and their skills. It is mining the resources of their narrative and their history and their story. It is helping them to connect the dots of the places that they've been and the things that they've done to understand how that fits uniquely into the wonder of what God is doing in this world. And what I've discovered in a little bit of anecdotal research is that most churches, large and small, do not have an intentional leadership development system. They don't. They just hope that it happens along the way. And then you wonder why your groups fell apart. Well, one, that person is an introvert. They're not an extrovert. And if you had taken a little bit of time to do perhaps a Myers-Briggs assessment on them, then you would have known that they're an introvert, which means that they recharge alone and not with people, which means that you cannot stick 15 people in their living room every single week and expect them to be happy about it. It might just be personal to me because I'm an introvert. And the thought of having a horde of people in my living room every single week makes my skin crawl because I don't like a broad range of shallow relationships. Okay, my circle's so small it's a dot, quote Drake, all right? But if we take a little bit of time to actually develop people, to actually mind the way they're made, then we won't stick nervous people at the door and then get mad when our welcome team is not welcoming people. Some people are not made to welcome people. They're just not. And they're, well, every Christian should show hospitality. Yes, two degrees. But every time you stick somebody whose face is like this at the front door, you've just determined that that family's never coming back again. And I can run this through a gambit of things, but we put people in places without knowing how they're made and then wonder why the thing we want them to do doesn't work. It's because we haven't developed them. There's a couple of tools that we use in our leadership development system. It's called Renovation Leadership Institute, uh, right path assessment to determine how, uh, what type of leader they are. So I'm a director slash driver, probably can tell that, okay? Uh, and, and that means that I should not have a whole bunch of direct reports because I will spend a lot of energy trying to run people too hard, too fast, too far when the Spirit is not at work in my heart. It's been helpful for me to know who I am in that regard. We use the Myers-Briggs. We use Strength Finders. Uh, we use a cohort development model where we will gather a bunch of people in a room to learn leadership principles. Uh, and then we put them in cohorts to discuss those things and to press them down into their lives. We have Renovation Leadership Institute 1, where it is all informational and cohort model in a general sense. And then we have Renovation Leadership Institute 2, where we then pull together uh, topic-specific or vocational-specific cohorts to begin to further develop people and release them into ministry. So this last fall, I had the privilege of doing a cohort on work and faith and trying to galvanize people around the idea that every one of us is in full-time ministry. We just get paid from different places and that there's more to sharing Jesus in the workplace than just catching somebody off guard at the water cooler, okay? How do you decide how many hours you're going to work? What does it mean to let a promotion go by because you know it'll take you away from your family? What does it mean to not allow the boss to be gossiped about even though he might actually be terrible? That's how you exist as a Christian in the workforce. And so we massage those things over the course of eight weeks, and, and, uh, and I've already heard back from many, many people how it's changed the way that they work. And, and there were courses across the breadth of several different ideas, topics, uh, and aspects of people's lives, releasing them into the world rather than trying to maintain them to accomplish what we are doing. You have to distinguish discipleship from development and have a very specific, very tangible, mapped out leadership development plan. Number three, you have to develop people theologically for a world beyond the walls of your church building, meaning that they need to be able to distinguish Bible knowledge from biblical worldview. 
They need to be able to distinguish Bible knowledge from biblical worldview. I don't want to pick on the Baptist. Actually, I do. But uh, being able to do a sword drill very, very quickly doesn't prepare you for how to face much of what happens in the world, how to think through uh, politics, how to think through economics, how to think through finance. You can't just throw verses at those things. You have to have an understanding of how the Bible informs the way you see all things. And if we're not taking the time in our teaching and our preaching to help people distinguish between I know what that verse says and I know what these verses mean and how I live through a lens of applying them, then we're selling them short. And we'll have a bunch of people full with Bible knowledge but unable to function in the world. Number four. We have to make it about them and who they can be when fully walking in their calling rather than about their usefulness to our expression of the church. So this is a follow-up to for them, not from them. But more specifically, finding out what it is that they need to be who it is that they need to be. Maybe they don't need more training courses. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't need more assessments. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't need a gifts, gifts analysis. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't need one-to-one -one discipleship. Maybe they do. It is an intentional approach to making it about them for their ends rather than about you for your ends. Number five, commissioning people to the marketplace as you would to the mission field. Now, this is really, really cool. I believe for most of us as church leaders, we've been a part of many, many commissioning services, and all of our future missionaries come to the front, and we lay hands on them, and we say, uh, God bless them and keep them as they go to India, as they go to Pakistan, as they go to Africa, as they go to Paris. Lord, make them fruitful. Lord, multiply their work. Let the gospel blossom in the lives of the people they encounter. Why in the world would we not do that for CEOs, for sanitation workers? My goodness, for school teachers. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we do it for guidance counselors? Are we not releasing all of these people into mission fields? So I would encourage you that every time you think about commissioning your missionaries overseas, think about commissioning your missionaries right here at home. In fact, I'll go one step further. You should have a twice a year commissioning service for everybody in the marketplace. Once in the fall and once in the spring as the years reset at those two kind of ministry calendars. You should preach a sermon about what it means to be in full-time ministry but be paid from different places. And at the end of that, you should invite everybody up. And you should have your elders or your pastors or, or, or some of the laity, whoever you believe walks in authority in your community, lay hands on them, pray for them, and send them out. The same way you would do if you were sending out a church planter or sending someone overseas because they too are going into a mission field. Number six, encourage people to surface ministry for which you can equip and support them versus developing ministries for which you must fill roles. So you hear what I said there? Say it again. Encourage people to surface, okay, ministries for which you can equip and support them versus developing ministries for which you must then fill roles. So I'll give you two examples. One is presently happening, another is forthcoming. We had a young lady uh, who was very, very passionate about foster care and she wanted us to have a foster care ministry. And because of the culture, by God's grace, I'll say that, by God's grace, because of the culture of our church, she knew that all she had to do was say, I want to do this foster care ministry, and that she would be buttressed and bolstered with all the support that she needed. We didn't have a foster care ministry. As a matter of fact, I worked in foster care to pay the bills before we launched Renovation Church publicly, 
And I have a heart for foster care, but we just didn't feel like we had the people resources or the energy to do one more thing. And if you planted a church or you're leading a church, then you know that feeling. I would love to do that, and I would love to do that, and I would love to do that, but daggum, man, we can't do everything. And this young lady comes up and she says, this is the cry of my heart, and I'm going to do this. That's how she actually said it, I'm going to do this. I said, well, I'm not trying to stop you. She's like this big. I'm "I'm not trying to stop you. Full of fire. In fact, I'm going to make sure you have all the support you need. Inside of five months, she had birthed five foster care communities, small groups that were support systems for families in our church who were fostering. It catalyzed a foster care movement in our church where new families, because of what she did, not because of the sermon I preached, not, not because of the new initiative Pastor Leon's put into place, but because someone who was just a part of our community with a passion for children who were parentless said, I'm going to do this. She catalyzed the movement. And within a year, we had 10 or 11 brand new foster families, all from the bottom up rather than from the top down. Second example, uh, we have an environment called Renovation 101. It is something that we take people through to uh, uh, get them oriented with our community and who we are and what we are about. And I had a young lady raise her hand uh, just this past Sunday, and she said, do you all have a ministry to those with special needs? And I said, we don't. But if you tell me how you want to get it done, you'll have all the support you need. And she was shocked. She was shocked. She pulled me aside afterwards. She said, I've never experienced anything like that before. Usually when I say something like that to a pastor or to the pastor, they say not right now, or that's not a part of our vision, or we have no long-term strategy for that, or maybe down the road. Nobody's ever looked at me and said, if you want to do it, we'll make it happen. And she's going to be a part of our church for a long time, I know it, because I see the spark and the hope in her eyes that she knows that her ministry can be fulfilled through our vision. Number seven, you have to preach the whole gospel. I know y'all waiting for that. You have to preach the whole gospel. What do I mean by that? You're not going to like this. The gospel is not a message about personal salvation. The gospel is not a message about personal salvation. The heart of the gospel is the total cosmic reorienting of all things. I can give you a bunch of verses if you need them. I can give you a bunch, but you got to remember that our theology doesn't start in Genesis 3. It starts in Genesis 1. All right? And when God made the world and when he made people and when he created all of this, he said, very good, very good, very good, very good. And what happened in Genesis 3 was not just a vertical breach. It was a horizontal breach. It was a downward breach, kind of in the shape of a cross. Isn't that cool? Because by being prideful and and idolatrous and wanting to be God, Ish and Isha, Adam and Eve, not only severed their relationship with the triune God, but then they severed the way that human beings are supposed to relate to one another, and they severed the way human beings are supposed to relate to the world that was given to them to steward. What does that mean? That means that the repair that God announced in Genesis 3 to proto euangelion the coming of Christ who, who would crush the head of the evil one, though he would bruise his heel, can't just be about your individual rescue from hell. That is a Western lens laid over a corporate vision. So that means that our gospel has to encompass a view of a world made right. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus says, at the renewal of all things. I'm not a Greek scholar, even though I took Greek 1 and 2 in seminary, but it means all in the Greek. Okay? Acts 3, Peter, in preaching, says that right now, Christ has been taken to heaven. But when he returns at the renewal of all things... There again, 
all things. Colossians 1, he was before all things. Hebrews, he holds all things together by the word of his power. Revelation 21, 1 through 5, heaven comes down, we don't go up. It means that we have to care about the socioeconomic and emotional condition of people, not just if they get fire insurance to get on to glory. And that's the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew, is it not? And so then you have to reverse engineer it and you have to think about, well, what was the gospel of the kingdom? What did it mean? Well, when the kingdom broke in, Jesus healed, he fed, he clothed, and he declared. All of that was the gospel work. And when you preach the whole gospel, let me connect the dots for you, and you get people developed around a biblical worldview and not just biblical knowledge, then you prepare them to engage the reality of the world in which they exist. So let me say a couple of uncomfortable things. When you preach the whole gospel, it will pull you into uncomfortable political and social commentary. It means that the Supreme Court cannot pass a law redefining marriage without you stating a biblical position that is clear, concise, and loving of those who are on the other side of your biblical position and moral stance. It means that you cannot purport that one party is a reflection of the whole of Christ. It means that you will be caught uncomfortably in the middle, liberal sometimes and conservative others. And it means that you gotta teach your people to be that way too. Preaching the whole gospel requires that you become a cultural anthropologist which means that you can't put 20 hours into a sermon. Nobody needs your dissertation every Sunday. They need to understand how what Jesus did and said applies to their life right now. That means six hours in the commentary, seven if you want to use God's number, and, and the rest of your time among people, learning what it means to live in the reality in which they exist so that you're not answering questions that nobody's asking, but you're actually engaging people where they are. It means that it will cause you to lose good people to greater opportunities for God's gifting in them to shine elsewhere. And you gotta be okay with that. Not just okay, you have to be celebratory of that. You have to be celebratory of that. That's what it means to preach the whole gospel. Lastly, number eight, in order to do this, in order to shift your mentality to for them, not from them, in order to move out of pride and into activation, in order to, to live out the fullness of seeing Christ fill every nook and cranny of this world, you have got to have a vision so audacious that it requires people to be pushed beyond the needs of running the church and toward the necessity of fulfilling God's vision. It's got to be so big, so audacious, so ridiculous that the idea that fulfilling this vision would be having enough volunteers, which our people shouldn't be volunteers anyway, by the way, because nobody volunteers for the body of Christ. They are ambassadors of Christ. But the vision has to be so big, so audacious, so ridiculous that the idea that it would be fulfilled in filling the room would be laughable. The idea that it would be fulfilled in filling out your volunteer roster and having a cool band with a cool sound would be laughable. That it can be nothing less, nothing less than total global revival. And that is something that people will sacrifice for, that is something that people will live toward. That is something that will require you to equip people to do far more, move far greater, and activate in more dynamic and dramatic and wondrous ways than you could ever contain in your system. And that is when we will see the kingdom break in in a way that Jesus told us it would and that we cannot contain or control. That's movement.